Hello and welcome to See Here on Saturday. We have a packed programme for you today, so sit back and enjoy. And I'll be bringing you up to date with the deaf news later. We visit Bradford and find out about the difficulties faced by the Asian deaf community. We talk to the NDCS about their project which highlights the double discrimination that many ethnic minority young deaf people experience. We needed to find out whether we were meeting the needs of minority ethnic families with deaf children across the country. Are you a budding poet? We spend a day at a poetry workshop and find out how written poetry is translated into British Sign Language. And the Royal School for the Deaf in Margate mark the new millennium by making a video of their school's history. We meet trainee camera woman Carol Ann and find out why she wants to make a living behind the lens of a camera. Now it's over to Ilan for the Deaf News. Hello and welcome to the Deaf News. The University of Reading are running a BA degree course in Theatre Arts, Education and Deaf Studies. Applications are invited from deaf people over the age of 18 who are interested in an integrated three-year full-time course. The course is unique in that it utilises deaf culture and the language to explore theatre arts. It's practically based with an emphasis upon workshops and performance. What have you been doing all day? I'm trying to talk to you. I'm trying to talk to you. Talk to me! There are still places available for October this year and applicants need two A-levels which is the normal university entrance requirement. For more information, contact the admissions office at the University of Reading. Next Friday and Saturday is the NDCS's 12th Annual Technology Exhibition. It's the longest running technology showcase of its kind in the UK and will feature over 70 exhibiting manufacturers, suppliers and organisations. The event brings together consumers and manufacturers to ensure that designs of new equipment meet the needs of deaf children and adults. Lara and Clive were there last year. The exhibition takes place on the 23rd and 24th of June at Dunstall Park Racecourse, Wolverhampton. Entrance is free to all visitors on both days. Friday is Professionals Day with a Family Day on Saturday. In August, the Cambridge Arts Theatre and the Cambridgeshire Deaf Association are running a third summer school for deaf and hearing youngsters aged 11 to 18. This annual project is aimed at uniting the skills of deaf and hearing young people in order to create a new and innovative performance piece. It takes place from the 14th to the 25th of August. It's led by both a deaf and hearing director with a sign language interpreter provided throughout. There are still a few places left and you can come from any part of the UK as accommodation is provided. 
If you're interested, get in touch with us for more information. Now, for some news of special interest to those of you who are keen on football. David Campbell Celebrity Soccer School will be running a superstar soccer roadshow during the summer holidays. It will be touring the country with one week long courses for children aged between 5 and 18. They want to attract young deaf footballers so all the venues will provide a sign language interpreter. The roadshow starts in Belfast and finishes in London. To find out if there's a course taking place near you, look on our website for details. Now, it's back to Lara. Thanks, Elan. Recent research has found that Asian children are three times more likely to be born profoundly deaf than those from different ethnic backgrounds. But a study by Bradford Social Services says that almost five out of every 1,000 Asian children in the city are deaf compared with one in every 1,000 among the non-Asian community. As a result, the local education authority has had to tailor their services to meet the needs of Asian deaf children and their families. Our reporter, Sabina Chowdhury, went to Bradford, home to one of Britain's largest Asian communities, to investigate the difficulties faced by Asian deaf children and their families. Yes, I remember. I'm here at Thorn Park School for Deaf Children in Bradford. They admit children from Bradford and neighbouring districts from the age of two right up to 19. What's special about this school is that nearly 70% of the pupils are Asian and the majority of them come from a home in which English is not the first language. As a result, the school not only provides an education for the children in the classroom, but also for their parents, both at school and at home. Let's take a look. The biggest problem facing deaf Asian children and their families is communication. At school the children are taught English through sign language, which is fine, but then they cannot use this at home because not all families have English. The family's first language is likely to either be Urdu, Punjabi, Hindi, Gujarati or Bengali, so the children cannot communicate. So while the deaf child is learning English at school, this isn't reinforced at home. It's very difficult for the families. And of course, because dads are usually working in many, many cases, and usually have the English language, but aren't doing the primary parenting, it becomes very difficult for the mother. She feels, oh well, you know, I've got to learn English, I've got to do this, I've got to do the other, and it's very stressful. And she's trying to keep on top of learning the sign, learning the English, doing the parenting, being a good wife, and it's, it, it just saps their confidence. I'm here with the Najib family, as you can see. There are five children, three girls and two boys. All the girls are deaf, 
and the boys are hearing. This is a typical traditional Asian family, with father here going out to work and mother bringing up the children. This family's first language is not English. It is, in fact, Punjabi. However, they can all use sign language. try to arrange home visits to try and encourage families to come to the school to the parent and toddlers group which is a brilliant opportunity for the Asian families to see what goes on for some of these parents they've never seen another deaf child they've never seen a child wearing a hearing aid so it's important that they come and have this opportunity My first language is Punjabi, but uh, since I've had my children, my first language is uh, British Sign Language at home to communicate with my children. I, I learn from school, I go home, I teach my husband how to sign. Oh, drama, no, 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 playing here. Brilliant. This is a sign language class for Asian mothers. The school run them weekly to encourage mothers to be able to communicate with their children. Not only that, but also to improve relationships between the parents and the school. Some families don't like them going out at all because it's not, it's not the done thing. So I've had to use all my powers of persuasion to let them know that, you know, we're not teaching them anything that's going to be against the family values or against the cultural mores and things like that. I'm now here at Leeds University, where a team of researchers led by Professor Wakar Ahmed are leaders in the field of ethnicity, deafness and social issues. They've investigated the many complex issues that impact upon the development of deaf Asian children and their families. Let's go and meet him. One of the difficulties that deaf children face is that very often, because of the lack of communication or very poor communication within the context of the family, they learn less about their culture, their heritage, their religion, and, and those aspects of their very important identities. And that means that schools have a particularly important role to play in making sure that children uh, are, are given a rounded education, not just about learning about history and so on, but learning about who they are. Can you give me an example? This is an example from a Bangladeshi mother of a, of a deaf child who said that I send my child to school and he comes back an Englishman. Rather a, a, a sad statement uh, indicating the fact that the child learns very little uh, which is positive about his background, his identity and his ethnicity and, and so on. The end result of that, in, not in all the families, I must admit, uh, uh, stress, but in a large number of families, uh, that you end up with the problem of both the child feeling isolated and the parents feeling guilty about not being able to do the best for their child. Mm. 
ਇਹ ਸੀ ਮੈਥ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਨਾ ਕੋਈ ਥੋੜਾ ਬਹੁਤ ਮੇਰੇ ਅੱਗੇ ਸਾਹਮਣੇ ਕੋਲੇ ਮੈਂ ਉਹ ਉਹਦੀ ਹੈਲਪ ਕਰ ਸਕਦਾ ਤੇ ਕਿਰਮ ਬਾਕੀ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਲੈਂਗੁਏਜ ਇਤਨੀ ਮੈਂ ਨਹੀਂ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਜਿਤਨੀ ਇਹ ਮੰਮੀ ਜਾਂਦੀ ਹੈ ਜਾਂ ਉਹ ਖੁਦ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਬੱਚੇ ਤੇ ਬਾਕੀ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਮੈਂ ਹੈਲਪ ਕਰ ਘੱਟ ਹੀ ਕਰ ਸਕਦਾ ਕੰਮ ਕਰ ਪਾਈ ਆਪਾਂ ਦਾ ਹੈਲਪ ਕਰਨਾ ਨੇ ਇੰਗਲਿਸ਼ ਵਿੱਚ ਇੱਕ ਵਰਕ ਹੋਇਆ ਤਾਂ ਪਾਈ ਆਪਾਂ ਹੈਲਪ ਕਰਨਾ ਨੇ ਆਈ ਥਿੰਕ ਇਟਸ ਰੀਲੀ ਗੁੱਡ ਆਈ ਡੋਨਟ ਆਲਵੇਸ ਅੰਡਰਸਟੈਂਡ ਦੈਟ ਬਟ ਹੀ ਵਿਲ ਰਿਪੀਟ ਥਿੰਗਸ ਅੰਟਿਲ ਆਈ ਅੰਡਰਸਟੈਂਡ ਮਮ ਕੈਨ ਸਾਈਨ ਥਿੰਗਸ ਲਾਈਕ ਬਿਸਕਟਸ ਐਂਡ ਥਿੰਗਸ ਵਿਚ ਹੈਲਪ ਅਸ I don't always understand my mum's friends because they speak Punjabi and I find it confusing. But my mum understands and explains to us, but I don't always understand. Har maa baap di ek khwahish hundi hai ki bacche sade pad jan. Agar jide bacche sahi na ya nahi sahi, agar inna bachiyan vich koi doctor ho janda hai ya koi engineer ho janda hai to daf bachche tu sade vaste aur khushi tu baat kehdi ho sakti hai. Lekin phir assi sara kuch bhul jande hain. Thorn Park School is one example of many schools in the UK that are faced with the task of meeting the needs of a diverse range of ethnic deaf communities. It has been achieved here with sensitivity, awareness and imagination. They recognized gaps in service provision and restructured their services, which has been a success. But not all schools have achieved this level of provision. It really depends on the area you live in. For some time the National Deaf Children's Society has recognized the difficulties faced by ethnic minority deaf young people and their families. They ran a 3-year project looking into this issue. It highlighted the double discrimination that many of them face. With me now is Anne McDowell, Director of Family Services for the NDCS. Hello Anne and welcome to the program. What prompted the NDCS as a voluntary organization to run this project? Well, the NDCS is committed to me meeting the needs of all families with deaf children, and we needed to find out whether we were meeting the needs of minority ethnic families with deaf children across the country. So we set up the project, which was run by Melissa James for three years, um, and we used the findings from that project to decide where we needed to go in the future with our work. As a voluntary organisation, we've obviously got a lot of influence, and it's crucial that publicly funded voluntary organisations who can have influence with government do represent all families with deaf children. What are the main findings from the project? Well, we found that there really was double discrimination, and that if you were from a minority ethnic community and you were deaf, you had two sets of barriers to stop you from achieving equal access to services. Um, we found, for example, that um, services often weren't provided in the way that people needed them. And everybody has the same basic needs for information, support, advice, and so on, and all the things that NDCS provide. But we found that we needed to do some of them in different ways in order to meet those different communities. Does the NDCS have any future plans to bring about changes? Well, we've already started to make a lot of changes as a result of this project. Um, first of all, we've now got as one of our most important strategic objectives to widen access and make sure that our services are accessible to everybody. Um, we've been producing information in a range of community languages, both on paper and on audio tape. And we now have access to a service called Language Line, which works a little bit like Type Talk. And hearing parents of deaf children can ring in and get information and advice in the language of their choice. So that's a really important service for us to be able to offer. Do you think that the work of Thorn Park School could be adopted by other local authorities? Yes, I think it can. Um, we know that in some local education authorities, similar work is happening. But I have to say, we've been really impressed by what we've seen at Thorn Park School, and we really hope that other LEAs will pick up some of the good practice points from that work. Let's hope that this double discrimination does stop soon. Thank you so much for coming in. This is a story we'll be returning to, but now it's over to Ilan. Right. As an actor and now a presenter for See Here, I'm used to being in front of the camera. But what's it like behind the lens? Well, we meet Carol Ann McGinley, who from a very early age knew that she wanted to be behind the camera. What 
become director of photography in film and television drama. And I want to work in that area because I love pictures, I love moving images, and I love using my imagination to create good, good picture. Um, I want, I did talk with the athlete, I love her. Awareness. Oh, it's because that's what you need more than you feel. Just one more. FT2 is the national training program for the film and television industry. Um, we train new entrants who are primarily young people between the age of 18 and 30 to train up over a period of two years to become junior assistants in the craft and technical grades for the freelance sector. Carol Ann in particular is with us training to become a camera assistant clapper loader. Doing now, I'm charging up the battery. They take about seven hours before they're ready again to charge it in a pot. Red light. Whenever you want to go. I 
think in, in all truth, it's, it's a difficult industry to get into anyway for almost anybody. I think for a deaf person, it's possibly more difficult simply because of the concern, the anxiety, and so I'm sure to a certain um, degree discrimination and prejudice. Um, however, what Carl has shown um, is that by coming onto a scheme like FT2, whereby we make the arrangements, we secure the attachments, we tell the attachments with her permission that she is deaf, um, she then goes on to attachment. And she then, as a human being, works it out and creates her own opportunity with the support of the production. She's there winning hearts and changing minds day in and day out. And so far, um, the reports back, the feedback, and what Carol Ann herself has said, has all been incredibly constructive and positive. Deaf people are very aware about lighting because we never go, we never go to dark. Pop, no, like we can live free. We know not to have light here. Nothing too dark. We know black light help people not to read at all. But we can dark light. Why does not help to? If you'd like more information about the course, look on our website for more details. But now for some deaf history. Did you know that the Royal School for the Deaf Margate is the oldest public institution for the education of deaf children in Britain, starting way back in 1792? They have just produced a video to celebrate the school's history from the end of the 18th century to the present day. And it's called Breaking the Sound Barrier. Let's have a look at a clip. With me is Andy Wall, who is the producer of the video, and Peter Brown, the presenter. Hello there. If I can start with you, Andy, what inspired the school to make a video celebrating its history? Uh, well, in 1992, the school celebrated its 200th anniversary. Uh, and it was about that time that uh, the school commissioned uh, a book to tell the story uh, of the last 200 years. Uh, it was called a, a Tower of Strength. Uh, the book fascinated me greatly, um, and I knew also that in the school's archive, uh, many old films and photographs going back um, many years. And it was at that point I, I decided that it would be uh, a good idea to make a film. Unfortunately, at the time, um, we had neither the equipment nor the finance to follow it through. And it was some years later that um, we could actually make a start on making the film. Which part of the school's history did you find most interesting? I think the part which I was looking forward to actually working on was the, um, when the school, the old school at Margate was pulled down. Uh, it was a particularly emotive time and I, I've spoken to many people, ex-members uh, of staff and students, about the emotions that they felt whilst the old school was being pulled down and it seemed to be a particularly poignant uh, point in the film. 
The decision to keep the school operating on the site during demolition and rebuilding placed real restraints and demands on both the architect and the school staff. So was this a labour of love, or did you find it stressful? I think it was perhaps a bit of both, really. Um, it was thoroughly enjoyable, even though um, about a year ago we weren't sure if we were ever going to uh, get it completed. Um, we were then given a deadline. Um, a local theatre had offered us a slot in their year for us to premiere the film, uh, and we had um, less than a year to get it complete. At that point, we only had three minutes actually done. Uh, so we, we had our backs against the wall for the last few months, but um, luckily uh, we did manage to uh, get it premiered that night at the Theatre Royal in Margate. A few years later, the school decided to segregate the profoundly deaf from the partially hearing. At that time, there was a change in the supply of hearing aids. The government appointed a committee of surgeons and specialists to report on the manufacture of hearing aids. From this, they sponsored the manufacture and maintenance and supplied them to schools for the deaf. Now Peter, I know you're an ex-pupil of the school, but how did you get involved? I presented it mainly because I'm the assistant archivist, but my boss, the senior archivist, Jack Piggott, was my old teacher. And we both shared the same interest in deaf history. And somehow, we got into the school's history. The school was originally based in London, but then moved to Margate. Why was that? Well, at that time, when the school was founded in 1792 in London, there wasn't a huge population. There were very few diseases around. But then in the 1830s, the population had grown and illnesses such as influenza and cholera were increasing. The school committee had growing concerns and so looked for a more appropriate site, which was Margate. It was close to the sea and the air helped to alleviate TB and other illnesses. I was interested to see that in the early 19th century, some of the teachers were deaf. Tell me about that. Yes, there were quite a few deaf teachers at that time. They were brought in because Joseph Watson, who was the first headmaster, had previously worked under Thomas Braidwood, teaching in a private school in Hackney. Whilst Braidwood would teach the children orally, he noticed that some students didn't understand him, and so he asked the children who did understand to sign to those children to help them. As a result, he realised that deaf teachers were better than hearing teachers. I know this for a fact because he wrote it in Instructing the Deaf and Dumb, published in 1809. So the evidence is there. So there were deaf and hearing teachers, but would they receive the same salary? No, they didn't get the same the hearing teachers were paid more, almost double the amount. But there's no evidence as to why. The school now uses total communication, but was that always the case? No, total communication hasn't been used consistently since 1792. As you know, this myth exists that the oral method was best and that it helped to improve their signing skills, but that's not true. In fact, bilingualism was used years ago. They taught him BSL in the first instance, along with oral and written English. It was up to the children. If they spoke well, then they used speech. If they didn't, then they used sign language or fingerspelling. That continued until the Milan Convention banned sign language and everything changed. So after Milan, were the children then taught orally? Well, even though Milan had banned sign language and some schools did accept that, others continued to use it, but in a more total communication approach, including Margate School. 
the school will go on providing its own very special brand of education with vigour and foresight, hopefully for another 200 years. Well, thank you both for joining us. You can buy the video direct from the school for £11 and you'll find their address on our webpage. The late Dorothy Miles introduced many deaf people to the joy of poetry in British Sign Language. The Deaf Arts Organisation, SHAPE, has been running successful poetry workshops for many years. We were lucky enough to observe a recent one and discover how poetry is created. workshop is to make people feel confident as soon as they arrive with the people around them. We start off with a warm-up session using facial expressions, body movements, signing skills, imagination and we use objects to help us be creative. Then later on they each have to think about how they can use what they've learned to create their own poem. It doesn't matter if they use sign language, mime or whatever. There are no rules, because it's their own personal poem. OK, the next thing I want you to do is to think about where your creative ideas come from. I'll help you get started with this. I have a box. I open the lid. Out of it, I can take anything, maybe... What's this? Right, that's right, a ball. I'd like you all to think about your own box. The box, which is called the Box of Delights, well, that's to enable the participants to use their imagination to pull out any object, maybe a ball or a scarf, could be anything at all. It helps them realise they can use their imagination, which in turn encourages poetic expression. I also include the use of emotions to make them think of how they can use them and in what way. It encourages them to think about what's in a poem. It can be objects, emotions, lots of different things. So that's the aim of it all. Also, because of the earlier warm-up sessions, their confidence has been built up for the future. OK, it looks like this. Now, this was mine before. When I had this, I left it there and stood back, formed a D on my head. You don't have to physically pick it up and get bogged down with it. Just put it down somewhere and then get on with what you want to do. table were a number of objects to help them. They're simple things, like a tin of shoe polish. This will inspire their imagination, which could make them think of, say, an ice skating rink. Then they'd have to think about linking it to an emotion. Maybe they're at school, and it's dark with spider webs everywhere. The polish could make them think of cleaning. So it's useful to have objects to stimulate their imagination into expressive poetry.
like a helter-skelter. You know, a helter-skelter. Poetry is so important to deaf people because it's about using their language, their culture and experiences. Most people think, oh, it's just like sign song, that's fine. But no, there's another aspect of poetry. Using BSL, totally free of rules, where people can use sign language, mime, facial expressions, in fact, the whole body. There really are no rules at all. Deaf people can feel confident enough to do it. It doesn't have to be an interpretation of a written text. It can be a freely expressed poem from the heart. Fascinating. Have you ever been in a poetry workshop? Once, a long time ago. It involved all sorts of different movements. It was a bit strange. Anyway, if you're interested in any future workshops, you can get in touch with Shape. Well, that's it for this week, but do join us again next week when we look at how the DIY company B&Q are working to make their stores more accessible to deaf and hard of hearing people. And we go behind the scenes of the popular television programme, Changing Rooms. Sounds really interesting. And we bring in John Saver, who will be telling us why he believes that Section 28 should be abolished. We talk to some of the first winners of the Jack Ashley Millennium Awards. And, a year after the British Deaf News was relaunched, we investigate how successful the changes have been. So, thanks for watching, and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Behaving like this can